Hello, and welcome to the Friends of MLK 2021 Martin Luther King Day celebration. Unfortunately, we are not able to celebrate today in person, and as I would, as I would have loved to have seen your lovely faces in front of me. I would have loved to have participated in the community service project alongside uh, you and our, and, and our youth. But we thought it was best in, in light of COVID and everything going on that we provide a program for you that was uh, we pre-recorded and to keep us all safe. And so I hope that you enjoy today's uh, program from the comfort of your home um, or wherever you may be. Our theme, the dream yesterday, today, tomorrow, was birthed out of a question that we asked ourselves as a committee. How do we give voice to the truth behind the stories of frustration, the stories of struggle, the stories of pain, the stories of victory, and the stories of hope that rest right here in our Quad Cities? In other words, where have we been? Where are we and where do we go from here? In thinking about that question and thinking about the individuals that we would invite to be on today, many, uh, we did not, do not have an exhaustive list of, of individuals of the Quad Cities that exemplify that, but we do have a few. But I was reminded of the purpose and the onset of the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, that young Dr. Martin Luther King found himself, himself thrust into. The purpose of the Montgomery bus boycott was not to repeal segregation laws, but rather to force the city to hire more black bus drivers. Its organizers also sought to change the seating policy to one that allowed seats to be filled on a first come, first serve basis, and to demand to be treated with respect and courtesy. The boycott included 40,000 riders who refused to ride the buses for 381 days. But despite the success of the boycott, it wasn't until Oreo Browder, Susie McDonald, Claudette Coven, and Mary Louise Smith brought a civil lawsuit against the bus company that the boycott elicited positive change. Their case, Browder versus Gale, 1956, was used by the Supreme Court to end segregation on buses. The Supreme Court ruling increased the momentum of the American civil rights movement as we know of it today. Many of us think of Rosa Parks when we think about the bus and her role. But I just wanna quote something that she said. Rosa Parks said, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically, no. The only tired I was, was tired of giving in. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of us who are tired of giving in. And thanks to the example of the peaceful protests in March, marches, that we not only saw throughout the 60s, but yet we saw here throughout the year 2020. Thank you for those who are still fighting against the injustices in our society that we still see today simply because of one's exterior color, how one perceives is perceived to be, Keep fighting the good fight. Knowing that the fight that we fight, it's not a carnal fight, but the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we will stay on bended knees. We will continue to fight the fight in the way that we demand justice, that we demand peace, and we go about it in ways that we will continue to be noticed. That you will see me. 
and I want you to know that I see you. So we continue to tell our legislators, keep fighting the good fight. The arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. To our civil service, uh, police officers, healthcare workers, continue the, to fight the good fight of faith. And don't let the pressures of this world get the best of you, but do the right thing and continue to fight against the injustices that you see, even when there are injustices within the organization in which you work, you live, in the communities in which we live. That's what Dr. King did. While we have not had an opportunity to meet face to face and do uh, community service, I do want to make sure you, you know that today, uh, on Martin Luther King Day 2021, you still have an opportunity from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock p.m. to participate in Punches Blessing Box campaign that is going on right now at KWQC. You can drop off toiletry items, anything that you would like to drop off, and they will find a home with someone that is less fortunate. So I say thank you to today's slate of guests. I say thank you to the members of the MLK Day Planning Committee. And I say thank you to you, the community, Quad Cities. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep your hand to the plow. Don't look back. We have a dream of Dr. King to live out still. And we must continue to fight for the dream that he fought for years ago. We continue to fight today and our children will fight tomorrow. That dream that simply, simply says that one day his children, and I say my children, will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Enjoy today's program. Thank you, and God bless. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kit Evans Ford. I am the founder and director of Argos House of Hilligan Hope here in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, so who are we? We are a healing house. Uh, for women in the community, not too far from downtown Davenport, where we provide free holistic services for women healing from violence and abuse. Um, but what's unique about us is that we're also a bath and body product company, uh, what is called a social enterprise, where you start a business um, that not only provides a product and a service, but also use that profit to help um, a cause. Um, and so our cause is helping women and children healing from violence. So we provide therapies, we provide animal therapy, domestic violence support group. Um, you know, um, we're blessed because of our private donors, our grants, and also the profit from our business. When a woman is in need, um, nine times out of 10, we've been able to help her, be it financially or with holistic care and services. Um, you know, it's been quite the journey over the last, we're three years old. <laughs> uh, we've had, you know, the community has really rallied behind us to, to move things forward and I'm, I'm grateful to God. You know, we've been able to grow our business in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we're in over 25 retail locations, but we've really had to focus on expanding our online, our e-commerce sales and efforts. Um, which has been um, really a unique time as far as our branding, our marketing, our social media. Um, so we've had to be intentional about that. You know, when I think about Dr. King and I think about beloved community, you know, I think about Argos House. You know, we are a healing house where women who of all ethnicities come. The thing about domestic violence, sexual assault, even childhood molestation, you know, those realities, it, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't connect to a certain type of color or income. You know, women who are black, white, brown, Asian, um, African, uh, African-American, Caucasian-American, uh, Mexican-American, so many different women have come to the steps um, to support groups at Argos House. 
um, and we are there journeying together hand in hand, rallying for each other, supporting in each other, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our social or economic class. Um, and I think that's what Dr. King called us to do as a beloved community. You know, our volunteers, our donors, our customers, um, our people of all different ethnicities. Um, but we're all here joining together for a common cause to really live out that mission of Dr. King, one beloved community, serving, loving each other, and supporting each other. So thank you for being part of the Argos House beloved community. Check out ArgosHouse.org. Peace. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to be before you today. First, I want to thank the friends of MLK for this chance to speak in celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. My name is John Will Crawford, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist here in the Quad Cities, practicing with Unity Point Rock Valley OBGYN. I moved here just two years ago, but in my short time, I've managed to survive two things I never thought I would see in my lifetime. One, the polar vortex of 2019, and two, the ongoing pandemic of coronavirus. 2020 has given us, if nothing else, a reinforced appreciation for our yesterday and to really value today as the gift that it is, our present. Because for far too many, tomorrow was not promised. COVID-19 has completely reshaped the way we practice healthcare in America. It has brought challenges to our providers and our hospitals that, frankly, we were not well equipped to handle. To be honest, I don't know if we will even see the full ramifications of COVID-19 in our lifetime. We have seen firsthand how the social determinants of health truly impact the care that is given to an individual and the outcomes one experiences. We have witnessed how inaction, delay of response, and casual dismissiveness have led to the death of over 350,000 Americans with preventable illness, with thousands dying more each day. We have watched how millions of Americans have lost employment, health insurance, and food security, while the top 1% have added billions to their wealth. It has not been easy. Our plans for the year did not exactly pan out as one may have hoped, but we have finally turned the chapter on 2020 and have moved into 2021. A new day, our tomorrow. We're moving into a new administration, one that has already made strides to achieve racial equality and health equity. We are now more astute to the things that truly matter. Our focus is sharpened. We have learned to prioritize family, wellness, love, and faith. So I have the opportunity to speak to you for a few moments about some things I hope we can all stay mindful of as we move into this year, to stay strong, healthy, and whole for our families and for ourselves. We know that total wellness and health starts in the home. It starts where we live, in our schools and workplaces, neighborhoods and communities. We have been taught to take good care of ourselves by eating well, exercising and staying active, stopping unhealthy behaviors such as smoking or excessive drinking, and maintaining regular checkups, screens, and immunizations. But our health is also determined by things we can't always control, such as access to social and economic opportunities, including the availability of sufficient housing, jobs, and lending practices resources and supports available in our homes, neighborhoods, and communities, such as organic grocery stores, green spaces for recreation and transportation, quality of education in our schools, graduation rates, job training, and access to enrollment in higher education, the safety of our workplaces and neighborhoods, access to health insurance, access for people with disabilities, the cleanliness of our water, food, and air, fairness of our social interactions and relationships with civic participation, interactions with law enforcement, incarceration rates. The conditions we live in explain why some Americans are healthier than others, but why Americans in general are not as healthy as we could be. 
It helps to explain why Blacks, Latinx, and Indigenous groups are dying at much higher rates of COVID than whites. But what can we do about it? Thankfully, so many of you showed up to the polls and exercised your right to vote. And that's a key step. Having elected officials in place to create policies that provide social and physical environments which promote good health for everyone. Always remember how important your vote is and exercise that right in every election to select our mayors, our judges, our sheriffs and representatives. But also early childhood education is key to health equity. Sustained poverty and racism can create chronic toxic stress that can derail healthy physical, cognitive, social, and emotional development. Research shows that early care and education programs can help narrow and equitable gaps. Yet only 40% of three-year-olds in the United States are enrolled in early childhood programs. In addition, studies have shown that parents' wealth shapes their children's educational, economic, and social opportunities, which in turn shapes their health. Certain programs will provide wealth building initiatives for vulnerable groups with financial education, coaching, subsidized savings accounts, job training, home buyers assistance, or loans to start a business. I encourage you to seek out early education programs such as Head Start or financial education seminars through groups like Economic Growth Corporation. These are some tangible, practical things that we can do to chip away at that large health equity barrier we face. Finally, I would encourage you to be your own health advocate. Speak up when you feel your pain is being ignored. Ask questions of your providers and require answers. Strengthen your own health literacy. Schedule your pap smears and colonoscopies and mammograms and COVID-19 vaccine. Take your vitamins, lose that 10 pounds, join that walking group, do whatever it takes to be here and to be healthy for yourself and your family. Keep dreaming big for your tomorrow, but be present today. Happy 2021, everyone. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Rogers Kirk, and I'm the uh, president and uh, chairman of the board of TMBC, uh, Lincoln Family Resource Center. Uh, the name TMBC, uh, Together Making a Better Community, is something that we started some uh, maybe 22 uh, years ago. It was an acronym for our church, which is Third Missionary Baptist Church. Third Missionary Baptist Church has always been, as we like to say, a church in the inner city uh, of Davenport, welcoming all uh, to be a part uh, of this community. Our motto is that we reach out into our community to, to help to show God's love to our community. We started back in, uh, about 20 years ago in a partnership with uh, the YMCA and uh, also the Davenport School Board, uh, school system. Uh, we, we started with a summer program and then we uh, moved forward to a after school program, it was outstanding. And then later, uh, the school took it over. And uh, But it's always been uh, a desire of mine, a vision to have a, a center uh, in our community that reaches into our community with resources. In our church, it was somewhat of a extension of our church. We, we have done many things in our church. We have done uh, parenting classes, we have done uh, mentoring programs and other activities that reached into our communities where people can find not only a safe haven, but a place to come and learn and study. Uh, not only God's Word, but also study uh, how to be just a better person. It was always the idea of that uh, I, we, I grew our church with the number of ministries or programs that existed in our church. And so it was a goal to begin to build something uh, in our community that would help to uh, enlarge and bring more people in. Uh, we started a project uh, 
that we would build a not only what we call a family life center and apartment uh, complex. Things fell through because of property we couldn't get. So, but, but the vision was always there. It's almost like saying that where there's no vision, the people perish. We kept our vision, our vision to, again, to reach out into our community. And so uh, we heard that the Lincoln School was coming available and they were taking bids on that. Uh, a group of us came together of our church and said, you know, since this one didn't work out, maybe God had this for us. And uh, we submitted our bid in and, and uh, as God had planned it, we were the one who was awarded with the bid. And so we started to look and see how we can use the Lincoln School building as that uh, resource, uh, that building that could help bring ministries and other things into our community right from the Lincoln Resource Center. And so this is where we are today. Still working on that particular project, but the vision that God has given us, we're moving forward with it. Right now, we uh, we have about nine tenants because the thing that uh, stood out more is that as we were talking about doing programming, we thought about all the number of other nonprofits that were doing program. There were many people in our community who were trying to do things that we didn't really want to duplicate what others were doing. So what we decided to do is say, well, look, there are many people who have great ideas of, of doing things for our community. How about use this as what I call as a nonprofit uh, incubator. You know, those individuals who have these ideas and who can come because they don't have uh, a place to, to uh, as an office space, a place to run their programs, maybe they can come together. And so it's, it's the vision that he's given me that that place would be a one-stop shopping. And right now we have in now we have programming uh, of boys and girls, we have basketball, we have uh, art, many uh, individuals who do art, uh, fashion magazines, and uh, right now we're doing school, schooling, uh, there at uh, our uh, Lincoln uh, Resource Center. So there are many things that we're doing. It just, it just amazes me how, how when God gives you a vision and you stay true to the vision, as I said earlier, this was over 20 years ago the vision came, and we've been trying to move forward in this vision, and here we are today, right today, and we're moving forward. It's just kind of like Dr. King, with his vision, and, and we have that vision, and we would really try to move forward in that vision. And I thank you so very much, and we invite you to come by uh, the Lincoln Resource Center, and, and just to see what is being uh, done to help our community. Thank you very much. My name is Kayla Babers, and I'm the project manager of United Way African American Leadership Society. Moving forward into 2021, ALS will focus on fostering the next generation of Black leaders and philanthropists and continue to help host the racial, economic, and academic divide that Black Black citizens experience every day. These divides will require very specific and intentional focus and investments to improve our community. With the help of our tri-chairs, Randy Moore, Ryan Sadler, and Reverend Dwight Ford, our passionate steering committee, and you, the community, we can create the change we want to see. In the coming year, expect ALS to provide resources and funding to Black businesses and organizations, spotlight and celebrate Black-led initiatives in our community, and play an integral role in hosting informative community conversations, whether those be in-person or virtual, all while continuing to provide mentoring and academic support for Black youth. ALS will continue to need the help and support of the Black community. If you would like to be a part of this growing initiative, email me at KaylaUnitedWayQC.org. Hello, my name is Gay Shannon Burnett. And my name is Jonathan Burnett. And we're from Azubuike African American Council for the Arts. And we're here to share our stories of success with you. 10 years ago, 
I took an artist space at Bucktown Center for the Arts just so I could create and maybe teach a few classes. But I felt that there was really a need to do more. And after volunteering and at the King Center and United Neighbors, I just thought that we could actually service the community a lot better if we were to form an entity. And six years ago, we became Azambuike African American Council for the Arts. We became a 501c3, so we would be able to have our own seat at the table and kind of control the narrative of what was needed for the African American community here in the Quad Cities. We felt that the Black experience should be told and should be developed by people who were living it. So Azimbuike started just to give voice to African Americans here, and we felt a good way of doing it that was through the arts. And one of our successful, more successful programs is actually Urban Exposure Independent Film Project. So Urban Exposure Independent Film Project is a 10 week program where we teach directing, screenwriting, cinematography, and editing. And each student leaves the program with their own short film. So how it came about was I came home to Rock Island uh, from Algiers, Algeria. I was working on a film with my father, who's also a filmmaker. And I took up a job, uh, one of many actually, as a substitute teacher. Um, I was substituting at my alma mater, Rock Island High School, and I was talking to a lot of the students there, uh, mainly black and brown students, about where they see themselves after high school. And um, some of the conversations were a bit disheartening. Uh, a lot of the students that I talked to, or a number of them, they didn't see themselves even graduating from Rocky, uh, which was sad because, you know, after graduation, you're supposed to go to college and, or maybe find a good job or, or, you know, just start your life. But they didn't really see anything past high school. Uh, so I made the suggestion of film school. I wasn't the best student. I was quite average, but I knew I was very creative. So film school worked for me and I thought it could work for them. They hadn't even thought about film school. They probably didn't even know what film school actually was. So I decided to bring it to the Quad Cities through Urban Exposure. And I would say that in the past six years, we have seen success. We have a number of students that are going to film schools at the University of Iowa, uh, Columbia, Chicago, DePaul, Boston University. We have students that have worked on independent feature films and semi-pro and professional feature films. And we also had students that have entered their short films into festivals here in the United States and in Canada and have won. So, I, but I think the more successful thing, the most successful thing is that it gives them a voice that they can use. In this time, leaving 2020 into 2021, the landscape has changed dramatically. And those are stories that need to be told. And I think the young people are the best people to tell these stories. So that's why I think um, Azubuike and Urban Exposure has been very successful in the past six years. And also, I feel that the groundwork that we have laid and the things that we're doing to ensure our longevity, <laughs> our longevity um, are going to be the things that really cement us to the community. And I really feel that our success is going to be that we are going to be here a long time, um, more than six years. So we know we're going to be around and we intend on giving as much service to our community as possible. Hello, my name is Frank Holly. I'm the president of the Punch organization. Punch is a uh, local nonprofit group uh, located in Hilltop, Davenport, Iowa. Punch, P-U-N-C-H, People Uniting Neighbors and Churches. And I want to thank the uh, friends of MLK for giving me this opportunity to stand before you and to address one of the issues that Dr. King was uh, so strongly uh, 
opposed to. That issue is food insecurities. Uh, food insecurities, and I want to say God bless uh, each and every one on this so very important occasion, this important day of remembrance. And as we gather in our various locations and endeavors, I want to encourage everyone to keep in mind who and why we honor this day. Now annually, we come together to honor one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world, the Honorable Dr. Martin Luther King, evangelist, activist, revolutionist, and visionary. Dr. King lived and exemplified the philosophies that he preached and represented. Philosophies that encompass fairness, justice, and equality of human rights for all mankind. One of the philosophies that Dr. King addressed at an early date was the rights of all individuals to be able to enjoy the basic human right of having adequate food and sustenance for a healthy lifestyle. Prior to his assassination, Dr. King was busy organizing the Poor People's Campaign. He realized that civil rights were absolutely necessary, but insufficient to address the squalor of poverty that so many were clothed in throughout the world. The Poor People's Campaign brought about expanded school meals and Head Start programs for children in the South. It caused the Department of Agriculture to release surplus food commodities. It expanded the food stamp program and made welfare more user friendly. And more importantly, the Poor People's Campaign established a moral compass for the country. Dr. King didn't live to attend the Poor People's Campaign, but he did establish one simple truth through his endeavors. In 1968, uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy addressed the Secretary of Agriculture, expressing the fact that hunger existing in America is a national disgrace. I wish I had time to get into that, but it's a national disgrace looking at the wealth that America owns. And the sad thing about that is that we are facing the same conditions today in 2021, 53 years later. Some things have changed, but the root cause of this national illness has yet to be cured. Progress has been made in many of our federal nutrition programs, but the level of hunger in the United States still remains a national disgrace. About one in eight households have food insecurities, meaning families don't consistently have the money or the resources to keep food on the table. And the sad thing is that households of color experience hunger at twice, two times the rate of white households. Yes, hunger, poverty, and food insecurities are real. Hunger, poverty, and food insecurities are still a major issue. And not only for our local Davenport, Iowa community, but for the totality of the United States and throughout the world. People are still struggling with being able to put food on their tables and to provide nutritional choices for healthy living. The last 50 years have brought all the necessary policy changes for a food system that meets the needs of all people, not by a long shot. But if we're reflecting on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, which we are, we should also be indulging in his faith, his faith in humanity, in the art of the moral universe, people to do the right thing, and acknowledging the progress that we've made thus far. Some progress has been made. Programs have been put into place that protect farmers, and ranchers, and local economies, and help low-income families purchase more fresh produce. The problem that existed 50 years ago is still here. And it's not going away until we address the conditions that enslave men and hold them captive to unjust standards. Food insecurity is still high in 2021. And with the onset of the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, the demand and the need for food has increased significantly. More and more people are losing jobs and losing access to the basic conditions of life. 
More money is being set aside for grants to make food available and to create access to that food. Food pantry lines are backed up in some cases for miles in some parts of the country. However, however, there are very few efforts being made to address the root cause of food insecurity, poverty, societal injustices, lack of access to fair housing, discrimination in jobs, education, etc., etc., etc. Many will say that this is not true. Many will say that the playing field is equal. We all have the same opportunities. However, there are some of us that know, we know that we don't all have the same starting point. Many struggle from the beginning. Lack of emotional and psychological stability caused by our surroundings and our conditions are hindrances to success resulting in poverty and hunger, which leads to academic failure, which leads to an inability to maintain sound transportation, to get and to keep a job, which leads to the inability to maintain a fair credit rating to buy a house, or the help to maintain a steady work history. These are factors that contribute to the conditions that cause food insecurities throughout America. These are the things that we must tackle. Currently within our local community, the Davenport Punch Group, a local nonprofit has taken up the battle. The Punch Group, People Uniting Neighbors and Churches, has established multiple partnerships within the local Quad City community to establish programs such as culinary classes, expanded food nutrition training, community gardens, and food pantry to address food availability and access issues and financial planning and health care and, and, uh, uh, for some of the local uh, homeless people. Partnerships were established throughout the full spectrum of community. Everyone has to play a part. Community was near and dear to Dr. King. This was one of the tenets that he held very highly. Food banks, local businesses, city and municipal organizations, healthcare industry, state and local colleges and universities, community schools and churches, and local citizens must all join in to help eradicate the root cause of this ailment that has afflicted our communities and nations throughout the world by addressing the underlying causes of food insecurities. We must continue to educate ourselves and instill pride and excellence in each other and not settle for the handouts, but demand to be first in line, become the head and not the tail. We must continue to strive to oppose the systemic bias and racism that is still alive and well in the United States. The late Congressman John Lewis said, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And Dr. King summed it up when he said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Don't give up the fight. Stay the course. Together, we can solve poverty, hunger, and food insecurities. God bless you, and thank you. Hello, I'm Tracy Singleton, founder and executive director of Well Suited. Well Suited is a nonprofit organization based in the Quad Cities that works to help create the opportunities for young boys of color here in the Quad Cities, in our community. Well Suited was started six years ago, and I started it because of my two sons. I was a single mom, things weren't always easy, but my village is what helped my boys get to where they are today. It was family, it was friends, it was coaches, it was mentors, and it was people in the community who cared about them. So when Well Suited was started, it was with that same premises, 
that it would take a village to help create the conditions for the young boys of color in our community. We started out with just one event. It was just going to be a one-time thing. It was a tuxedo event. What we hoped to do was give the boys an opportunity to see themselves differently so that they could see differently for themselves. So we had 25 men in the Quad Cities come together and rent tuxedos for themselves and for 25 boys. And that day started the change that we were hoping to see here in our community. On that day, we celebrated the boys. They weren't a stereotype, they weren't judged, they weren't made fun of. They were celebrated as young men who could dress up, look nice, have a photo shoot, have a black tie dinner, and leave feeling that there was value to who they are. That created Well Suited. From that point on, we went into the schools, we went into the community, we created signature events that at all times celebrated the boys. What they didn't know is that what we were trying to do is to change their opportunities. There is an achievement gap. We all understand that, we know that, we know the numbers. But I personally believe that the achievement gap is caused by an opportunity gap. And we wanna close that opportunity gap. These boys have the same hopes, the same dreams, the same wants, the same goals and ambition to succeed. But they don't always have the same opportunities. So we at Well Suited try to create the conditions that will change those opportunities for them. I heard, I mentioned the tuxedo event. We also have what we call our Embrace Race Luncheon. At this point, they're able to sit down at tables with CEOs, business leaders, and executives here in our community and start the relationship now. That could be the relationship they need when they graduate from college, finish trade school, or go on to a civil service career or a career in the trades. They've met the people they need to meet. They've made the connections that they need to connect. And we're changing their pathway to life. Dr. Martin Luther King always fought for opportunities. If you look back at everything that he's done from the Montgomery boycott all the way to the poor man's campaign, everything he did was about creating the opportunities that were just fair and just. He wasn't asking for anything that we shouldn't have. He was asking for things that should have been done. And that is what Well Suited does. We're not asking for things that we shouldn't have. We're asking for things that should be done. When it comes to health, education, income, opportunities, we want what's just right for these boys. So please keep your eye on Well Suited. We have things that are coming up that are going to place our boys in positions to succeed. If you want to be a part of Well Suited as an investor, and not investing just money, but investing in futures. If you want to be a part of Well Suited by being a volunteer or a mentor, or you simply want to see these boys succeed, then please contact us. Hi, I'm Thurgood Brooks. I'm deeply honored to have been invited here today to uh, speak to you all a little bit today about social justice. The welfare of my community, Rock Island, and the many challenges it faces has always been a deep concern of mine. <clears throat> so much so, that I decided to run for mayor of Rock Island this year in April, April 6, 2021. Before we get into uh, criminal justice and racial justice, let's talk a little bit about social justice. In recent years, Social justice has arisen across the country and has been a concern of many Americans more so than they have thought about before. Most anyone you ask will tell you they support social justice. And not only do they support social justice, they also believe that everyone should have their fair chance. This is a great start. But things get uh, complicated rather quickly there. If you imagine 10 people, all of them the same race, same gender, same age, uh, same physical and mental health makeup, um, and same educational background, and same group of the same or similar lo locations. You will say each of them uh, deserve and should have the same opportunity to obtain uh, happiness with no problem. Um, I would say this works. Even if you change some of the characteristics of those people, and you say some of them are less educated or maybe uh, wheelchair bound. As long as they all fit the same description, 
And the notion of them, the notion of them all getting a fair chance is easy to envision and support. But that's not how most populations are. People are different in so many different ways. It's what makes a community beautiful and challenging and all wonderful, all wrapped in one. So, let's say we take 10 people, but they are different ethnicities, uh, different ages, uh, different uh, location where they may, may have grew up, uh, may not have the same physical and mental health. Some, uh, some young, some old. It's still easy to believe that each of them deserve a fair chance. But where things get complicated is right where uh, the fair chance may look like. We will all, would all of them be equally able to succeed in a physical competition? Probably not. Could all of them acquire roughly the same score or standardized test or the SAT? Probably not. Would all of them be considered as equally deserving uh, for, the, for the communities? Probably not. Wanting to give someone a fair chance requires complex answers to complicated questions. When we bring race into the discussion, things get even more complicated. And we get uncomfortable very quickly. It's a difficult discussion. Some may worry that they may be considered inadequate. Yes, or even racist. Others may worry that they might be viewed as angry or uppity or expecting too much. Even day-to-day -day interactions can get loaded and radicalized and easy to give up on because things just get too complicated. Ibram Kennedy, the author of a bestseller, uh, How to Become Anti-Racist, takes the approach that strikes me as very helpful. He states that we should not be thinking of whether a person is racist or not because in his mind, that's no use and it's unuseful. What gets in the way of racial justice is the fact that many of our institutions are deep rooted in our racial past. These institutions throughout that past have disadvantaged some races over others. To come back to everybody getting a fair chance or fair share, picture this. We're at a track and field meet post COVID and there's a mile relay. There's five runners in the race or five teams. The race begins, and you notice one runner is allowed to leave the blocks three seconds after the others. The other runner uh, gets to run backwards. Yet another runner is required to push a wheelbarrow. And another runner is made to carry another athlete on his or her back. Now, this maybe seems silly, but I indulge me here for a moment. We cannot possibly assume that each of these runners has the same fair chance of winning this race. Similarly, people can, can get a fair chance, or people cannot get a fair chance if they are running this, the race under different conditions that advantages some and disadvantages others. Seeking racial justice, first and foremost, means to understand that not everyone starts in the race, starts the race from the same starting point and runs under the same conditions. So no matter how good the runner, no matter uh, what may be in front of them that they may have to overcome, the situation in front of them is stacked against him or her. Giving people a fair chance must take, you must take that into account. So, what does it look like in real life? Black home buyers are charged uh, home prices and interest rates at a higher rate than those of white home buyers, and we've known this for a very long time. Home ownership, home ownership is the most significant pathway to wealth in our society, and a pathway to black home ownership has been blocked. In a capitalist society, you need capital to obtain more capital. Our system has failed. Physical health is one of the greatest treasures a person can have. It's the way we go about, we're able to work and generate income. Our medical institutions have a long history of under and misdiagnosing of people of color and black patients because they assume that our pain threshold is higher than uh, a typical human being. 
This myth is deeply rooted in our slave past. These systems have failed them. It's not a, a secret that uh, black women are two and a half times more likely to uh, die when giving uh, birth to a child than our white counterparts. Our systems have failed them. Study after study shows that if an employee receives a job, uh, receives a job application from a white sounding name, that applicant is far more likely to get called for an interview than an applicant of a black sounding name. Even if all the details of the application are exactly the same, our systems continue to fail them. In other words, that strange mile relay that I referred to earlier <clears throat> is happening all the time. It's happening every day, it's happening everywhere. And that's where our main focus must, must lie if we truly want to achieve racial justice. So never mind whether someone thinks someone else is racist or not. Rather, what can each of us do in our own sphere of interest to change these systems? How do we handle our banking job, our nursing job, our human resource job, our government jobs, our day-to-day -day interactions within our community? Becoming aware and staying focused on the fact that much greater equity is needed to allow us to learn, to develop new perspectives, and to find ways in which we can uh, move in a way to create and bring about the true change that we want. We all have opportunities to be anti-racist and act as such. And they count, even if they are small. None of us are expected to single-handedly change the world. But it should take a good care, but it should take all of us, excuse me, with good care and a little, a little concern to take about the business of changing the world. Now, what does that mean for criminal justice? Isn't it true that a crime is a crime is a crime? So if I were to tell you that uh, there's a, a person who is addicted to heroin or fentanyl, do you envision a white person who is a victim of the opioid crisis? In the same breath, I were to tell you that there's a, there's a person who's addicted to crack cocaine. Do you envision a black person who is a uh, criminal? And why is that a rich white kid uh, injecting heroin at, at a upscale party uh, is seen as, is seen differently than a the poor black kid doing cocaine at the black party? Why are far more black men in prison for drug abuse than white people, when it's a fact at the level of drug abuse and the, the populations are virtually the same. Why do we see on a news report, at the news report, a police, uh, a police officer in the school using excessive or astounding levels of, levels of force against children, black children, which leads to that incident causing that child to have problems in the future, including incarceration. This is literally where the term school to prison pipeline comes from. Why is it that black victims of altercations often fear police intervention more than our white counterparts? It, this is simple. It comes down to perceptions. It's because our perceptions are not the same for everyone. And that's what we must change. Each of us in our own life to move social justice forward. We must do this. Because there's no other way for social justice if there is no racial justice, no criminal justice. So, on this occasion, this very important celebration, let's resolve that even though we ourselves may not have been around for our country's past injustices when they occurred, we are around now, and we must pay attention now. We must pay attention to how the race is being run, now and for our future. Not only must we pay attention, we must make it our responsibility, our duty, to bring about change. We will nurture anti-racist acts. We will use our voices in our neighborhoods, in our communities, at work, 
and the place that we worship. Everywhere. We will do our part to see that going forward, each runner has a, has a chance to change the way and has a chance to, to win the race. We will work toward racial and criminal justice because only then can we hope to achieve social justice. We will work to get everyone a fair chance and a fair shot to be a winner in this race we call life. So, as I thank you again for this uh, invitation to this wonderful occasion, I challenge us all in this great and grand new year to make it an intentional effort and a daily effort. What you can do to bring about social and true racial equality into your communities and your daily lives. Thank you.